Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 2014 FLC Tech to Market Virtual Forum. This is the uh, third and final live session for today, and uh, my name is Tom Stackhouse. I am Associate Director of the National Cancer Institute's Technology Transfer Center at the NIH. I am also Vice Chair of the Education and Training Committee for the Federal Laboratory Consortium. I want to remind everyone that as we go through this session, you will have opportunity to ask questions. Our speaker today, Wendy Kennedy, has said she would love to have questions throughout her talk, so please feel free to type them into the uh, chat box that's on your screen, and we will get them to her. Um, <clears throat> so I think I am really excited about this particular uh, session. Uh, it's something I know that uh, our office uh, is very interested in getting, to, uh, getting ourselves better at, if you will. So um, without further uh, ado, I'm going to introduce Wendy Kennedy. She is the founder of wendykennedy.com, Inc., or WKI, and she is author of the popular commercialization methodology, So What? Who Cares? Why You? This methodology has been adopted globally by organizations looking to bring a structured process to increase their commercialization success rate. Prior to founding WKI, Wendy spent more than 20 years at the executive levels of several technology startup companies where she created technology summary documents for presentation to investors, partners, and customers. It was here that she learned that through trial and error, how to create impactful two-pagers that communicate to many different audiences. I personally have had the pleasure of working with Wendy over the last few years as she shared her expertise and her creative thinking during our FLC National Meeting One Day Advanced Courses for Federal Technology Transfer Specialists. And today, Wendy is going to share with us her proven model for creating compelling technology fact sheets. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Wendy. Wendy? Great. Thanks, Tom. It's, uh, it's really great to be here, everyone. And thanks so much for taking time this afternoon to, I guess I'll say, pop into this session because uh, I feel like we're almost in a, a live conference session. This is fantastic. So um, I, too, am, am excited to have conversations with everyone today. I think uh, I, too, am a practitioner of this as uh, we also uh, face our own challenges here at WKI in terms of telling, you know, our story and and really like trying to articulate compelling propositions. You know, I think that's uh, really the theme for today. And the reason I chose the, the title, What's Your Story, is you'll see throughout the, the session that there's a theme to this, um, the key word being story. And so I think you'll see that there's a, a thread or a theme that runs through the presentation today. Um, and, you know, I always try to uh, temper the, uh, the introductions with uh, the realism that, you know, I think we're all doing great things with all the different documents and instruments that we create. Uh, so I'm not uh, professing here or preaching that uh, you should throw out what you're doing. I think I'm just going to share with you some tips and some techniques of things that uh, I've learned over the years. Um, and maybe you can sprinkle some of that into some of the documents that you're creating as well. So um, I think that um, marrying together what you're doing today with maybe some new thinking. I always, you know, approach these sessions as a participant by thinking, you know, if I can pick up one or two ideas, um, maybe I'll try those. Uh, so, you know, I'd approach this session in, in much the same way. Um, but having said all that, you know, I really I love this topic. Uh, you know, the whole idea of just how do we do a better job of communicating the value of uh, the different technologies, uh, new innovations and ideas. And I think that's what really uh, struck a chord with me when I started this company 10 years ago is just the opportunity to work with uh, very brilliant domain experts and present and help them present their ideas, you know. so. So I do love this topic, so I'll try to contain my enthusiasm because I know we have uh, just under an hour, um, and try to keep it a little bit more casual and conversational. So as Tom said, I encourage you to please pop your questions in, um, or your comments even. If you've got an observation or a comment, please uh, share that. Uh, you know, I hope you have a cup of coffee or tea in the middle of the afternoon today, and uh, maybe you know, I hope you even have some of your fact sheets in, in front of you. I think uh, that would be great. Uh, you can kind of ponder and think about some of these things in the context of your own organization 
um, and the, the policies that you have and the directives that you have. So, so I hope you find the session, um, this session can bring you some value. So just a little bit for, for those of you that um, I have not had the opportunity to meet, um, as Tom mentioned, I started a company about 10 years ago. We're going to celebrate our 10th anniversary, my goodness, um, next year. Um, so about 10 years ago, I started a company that could really focus on this whole area of helping to find the value in new ideas, um, and particularly in science and technology ideas. I had come from that arena, spent a lot of time working with very new and novel ideas, and, and more particularly working with the engineers and scientists who had come up with these new ideas. Um, and as all of you are probably more familiar than I, very, very passionate, um, committed subject matter experts who loved their ideas and wanted to see them make an impact in the world. And just the gap in understanding that existed between that passion and energy and about the science versus how they should present that to others in the outside world. And so that was what um, inspired me, I guess, to really create So What, Who Cares, Why You, uh, which is a methodology. Um, I always say, you know, like a simple, clean methodology. It's a very simple process. But it really resonates with those types of domain experts uh, to help them bridge that gap in the, the conversations and the presentations that they're having with people that they're looking for support from. And so, um, you know, we started a company, um, you know, about 10 years ago now in 17 countries, I would say, and counting, uh, to really help to solve that problem. Um, and so, we do touch in to different organizations as well um, who have um, interests to solve this problem. So a little bit of what you're going to hear today is actually just some of the things that I'm learning too from customers and, and innovators as, as we go about our business of um, just trying to help you know, really crystallize the business value of these new ideas. So really I think a useful place don't be don't be scared now of this big slide. I promise it won't be the, this will be the biggest slide of the whole presentation. But I think it's relevant, and I think it's a good place for us to begin. Um, and let me start by sharing a little bit of my my perspective or my point of view on this. I think we uh, invest a significant amount of time developing technologies. I mean that's an understatement, you know. But often we spend many months and sometimes even years. Um, developing new approaches, new therapeutics, new diagnostics, robotics, clean energies, whatever it might be. Um, we spend a lot of time and a lot of money. And yet we spend a disproportionate amount, a small amount of time preparing the document that communicates the value of that. And that's a little troubling to me. Um, I think, you know, we need to pause and, and think these I think these things through, but also just think about them in a little bit of a, of a different way. Um, I think what you see on the screen is what we tend to see in a lot of fact sheets. Um, we see a lot of language that is written in the domain experts um, language. We see a lot of big paragraphs like this. And we see a lot of uh, focus on the idea. Um, and a lot of focus on talking about what the idea is and in using words that a lot of people don't understand um, because they come from the field. And I would say with you know, a great degree of maybe uh, being opinionated or a great degree of experience, I don't know which, that we often say yes, but you know, most of our people understand our field that we're talking to. And I think that's a dangerous assumption. You know, we make a dangerous assumption about the subject matter knowledge of the reader. And I think what's even more dangerous is we assume they will do the translation to figure out why it matters to them. So many fact sheets have this kind of paragraph that you see here and actually have many of these paragraphs uh, written in a manner that most of us just can't easily understand unless you are the subject matter expert. And so if you if you look at this and then you look at something like this, you have to ask yourself, you know, we're all human. And I think we have to remember that. We're all human. What would resonate more with you? And so if you look 
I'm just going to go back. If you look and you read this paragraph, the biochemical cause of presbyopia, the crosslinks that form with age. I did not alter this, by the way. I just took out the name. And this is a great technology. That's one thing I do want to point out. This is not about the quality of the idea. But this paragraph translated looks like this. It's a technology to reduce lens stiffness. It goes on. It talks about allows the lens to thicken. Very clean words. Very much about plain, you know, I always say language your neighbor could understand. So allows the lens to thicken in the center um, during an attempt to focus on nearby objects. And then it talks about more tangibly what the idea really forms as. It's an, you know, I don't know if I'll get this word right, so ophthalmolic <laughs> pharmaceutical solution in a conventional eye drop bottle. So I think the more we can translate our innovations into a context that our readers can easily grasp, I think the better our chances of getting those readers interested. So in other words, unfortunately, we have to do the work. And that's you know, the difference here, I think, and a, and a theme that you're going to see um, that I'm going to hopefully just give you a few little things to think about. So in the next, you know, 40 minutes or so, we're going to focus on a few key topics. Um, just maybe what you think are some of the obvious things that maybe they won't be so obvious is what is the purpose of a fact sheet? And some common mistakes that many of us, including myself, make when we do fact sheets. What makes a great fact sheet? Um, I've just chosen five, what I consider I like to have, like small numbers of things and focus. I think those of you that have been in sessions with me know that. I like to kind of pick out a few things and focus on those. And I think in our session, that's what's best for us is what would be five things that I would want you to take away um, that you could maybe think about trying. And even some takeaway tips on, on packaging. I haven't, you know, over the years talked a lot about the packaging of ideas and packaging of these innovations, but I think we should talk about this a little bit in terms that we're going to do all this work to get these fact sheets to be compelling. I mean, we'll just talk a little bit about packaging as well. And then finally, um, a recipe to create maybe your own compelling fact sheets, and again, that you can pick and choose from. Um, and just so you know, uh, I have a, a link on my website that I'll share with you at the end where you'll be able to download some of the templates that we use here. And you can massage them and copy and paste them or do what you would like with parts of them, if you will, um, for your own purposes. But you know, I really want to stress that I want you to look at today's session as an opportunity to really reflect on your own approach to writing fact sheets. And not that I'm saying that I've got the only approach. Uh, I'm not here to tell you that what you're doing is wrong or that you should stop doing it and start over with something that I've got. Um, I think on the contrary, take a look at some of these techniques and see if you could use, as I said, one or two to spice up or enhance your own fact sheets. Um, because of our um, cross um, differences in labs with different technologies and different policies, um, and your own unique circumstances, I think you know it's more appropriate that you pick the tips that you want to take and apply. Um, I've tried to keep the session you know, fairly broadly applicable, so feel free to ask me specifics if you want as we, as we go along. So, Now, I don't often refer to Wikipedia, <laughs> but today I thought it was probably not a bad way to kind of talk about fact sheets, because I think fact sheets do come in many shapes and sizes, and they serve lots of different purposes. You know, everything from how to install a ceiling fan I saw on one of the uh, the government labor, um, government lab sites to proper nutrition, um, and so you'll see the theme of those look very different than perhaps what we're going to talk about today. But today we're focusing on technology fact sheets, uh, so things like new ideas, concepts, and innovations, um, and so. You know, product fact sheets would be much more feature specific, but what I really want to address are the things that you deal with, which are in technology transfer, it's new and novel sometimes ideas, um, concepts that may not be quite clear to people, the value in them, um, as well as just new product enhancements and things like that. So the new, new, um, that's where we're, what we're going to focus on today. And so, What's the real purpose of a fact sheet? 
And I'd like you to think about this question for a moment. Why do you use fact sheets? What purpose or role do they play in your organization? Um, I can tell you, just because of having been involved with the federal labs, that that question gets answered differently by people. So think about this for a moment. What purpose or role are fact sheets playing for your organization? And one of the things, um, some of you may have participated in the marketing uh, session that I did with the FLC a little while back. And today there was a question from someone where the theme about the question was around objectives. And I thought, that's a really great point to remember in this session today. Because what is the objective that your department has for fact sheets? What role are they supposed to play? And I think, you know, it's a very simple question, but it merits some time to think about the answer because really, you know, there needs to be a strategic purpose for these. They're, they shouldn't just be thought of like brochures. And so think about this for a moment. Maybe, you know, just jot down a couple of thoughts. What is the purpose? How have you been using these? And is that the way you want to continue to use them? Um, I think that's, you know, the, the key, key question. Let me show you what I would think the real purpose of a fact sheet is. To me, the purpose of a fact sheet is not to tell all. The purpose of a fact sheet is to capture the interest of the audience. So again, it requires that you know who the audience is. Uh, it's, you know, it can't be everybody. So who is your target audience that you're trying to reach with this fact sheet? And, if, and something I'll say more than once this afternoon is that it might be that you need to have several versions of a fact sheet, a couple of versions of a fact sheet for a single technology because you're trying to appeal to different types of audiences. I think that's a really great way to get a return on the investment because in terms of getting interest by um, your readers, by third parties, because all audiences don't care about the same things. So first of all, the most important thing is to capture the interest of the audience. I always say to people, the three words you want to hear, tell me more, right? And I think, you know, at the risk of getting ahead of myself, I think one of the dangers we have is we try to tell all. We're going to put everything in here. And that's, uh, you know, pardon me, but that's the kiss of death. So capture the interest of the audience. Give them enough to get excited, you know, and get them engaged. That's what we want to do. I think one of the, the pitfalls or one of the things, and I'm guilty of this too, so we're, we're all guilty of many of these things, is the purpose of a fact sheet is not to educate your audience. It's not to tell them everything about the technology, right? And it's certainly not to put all this detail, like you saw earlier in my single paragraph, and to overwhelm them with details. It, and it's you know not to answer all the possible questions that you can think of. Um, the more information you cram, sorry, into your fact sheet, the more overwhelmed they become, um, the more disjointed your story becomes, and you lose the interest. So it's almost um, by providing more, you gain less. And so I think Wendy? we want. Yep. I'm sorry. This is Tom. Yeah, I think that you know that's a very uh, interesting point that you're bringing up there. It's almost like you're trying to create a mystery to, to make them ask, tell me more, tell me more. Um, mm -hmm. We do have a, a question, though, that I wanted to ask you. Uh, it's kind of a, a general question. It's a, do you need a marketing background or more, maybe even broader, what kind of background do you think a person requires to be able to effectively create these fact sheets? I don't think you need a marketing background. Um, I think what you need is the um, the um, interest, the willingness to think about other dimensions to the idea. Because I think that, y you know, I would almost say that having um, the ability to just think about how to explain uh, technology in more of a layman's language. And I'm going to give people some tools today to help them, because it, that's at the core of our, our business, maybe not creating fact sheets, but at the core of our business is helping people 
to do this kind of translation. And I think many people can do this. Um, and I think, to a certain extent, depending on how far an organization, a lab, a tech transfer office wants to go, um, I think that the innovators themselves, the, the researchers and the scientists, can feed you a lot of this information if you present it to them in a way to be able to draw out the information from them. And so, you know, I, no, I don't think you need a marketing background. I think you just need... Um, a, just to turn an idea upside down and think about it in a different way. Think yeah. about it from the other side of the table. Right. Yeah, um, Wendy, I agree with you, particularly on the point about reaching out to your inventors. Uh, I think most of the inventors I've had conversations with love to talk about their science. And, and if, you, if you're honest with them and say, can you just tell me, tell me this at a very basic level, what is it? They will mm -hmm. be more than happy to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some of the um, the tools that we've used over the last ten years with inventors, um, I've put up on our website that people we you know I'll, I'll maybe just talk about them a little bit this afternoon. But you the the group on this call are welcome to download those tools. And I would say to you, those tools are day in and day out used with inventors to broker the conversation that you want to have about these topics because that's been the whole point of not to get on about so what who cares why you so much but that was the whole point Thomas so what who cares why you was to change the conversation with inventors because if we give inventors a, a different way to have a conversation with us we can draw this information out of them so we can write more compelling fact sheets so um, and I, had, I guess I would say I, we would not still be in business if people weren't successfully able to do that so I would say to all of you on the call, you can do this. You can do this very easily. You can use the tools that I'll leave on the website to change the conversation with your inventors to pull out the raw information, and then what you'll do is package it into your fact sheet. And so, um, so yes, I think that you know, the, what we're really asking or engaging, maybe is a better way, engaging inventors um, in conversation is to find out what is the real value proposition of the idea. And really, to me, that's the purpose of a fact sheet, is to pitch, you know, and many people don't like that word, but that's what we're doing. We're not educating readers on a technology. We are presenting or pitching the value proposition to them. What is the business value to them of this new idea? Um, and I think that that's where, you know, that that's the bridge, shall we say, that we have to cross, is that we can engage someone that we care about, be it an industry partner or whomever it might be, to really see the value in the idea. But the way we do that is to present that value through their eyes. And so that's what a, what a fact sheet should be doing, just engaging them enough with the right amount of information in each of the areas that I'm going to talk to you about to be able to say this is the value proposition of this idea. And so, you know, right now in terms of thinking about this theme of value proposition, what I'd like you to do, each of you on the call, is just, you know, pause for a moment and think about your own fact sheets. Um, and let's kind of, you know, take a closer look at them and see uh, what they consist of. And if you don't have them in front of you today, then I invite you to do this. It's just, you know, try to be, uh, play devil's advocate and look at your own fact sheets and see, you know, if they have any of the, the following five things that you see on the screen. And do a, a quick audit as I maybe talk through each of these points. Um, and it would be great if you could write down a brief summary of each point and then put a check mark or an X beside each one just as a, like a quick examination at the, at the doctor's office. So do you do any of these five things with your own fact sheets? Do you describe the idea in detail? So do you describe a lot about the idea? And in your fact sheets, and it doesn't matter, I wouldn't say, you know, if your fact sheet's five pages or if it's two pages, it's just what percentage of your document size is devoted to that? How much time do you spend on the idea? And how much time do you explain the details of how it works? Um, and how many charts and tables and statistical performance metrics and things of that nature? So. Think about all those things that are what I call quote unquote idea related and how much time you spend in your fact sheet on those things. Um, 
And then it's useful to take a fact sheet and look at, you know, go down and say, do you use acronyms and technical terminology to really validate the idea? Do you talk a lot about some industry standard terms in, in terms of acronyms or technical, you know, quote unquote jargon? Um, are you doing that? Do you describe, um, so in the area, if there is an area for the applications, do you describe the many different applications, and basically as many as you can? And do you describe them by, you know, broad sectors like there's a broad number of applications this can be used for, such as military, you know, uh, medical, you know, defense. Um, do you s describe them at that level? Um, and then finally, somewhere in there, how do you handle competition, or you know, do you handle competition at all? Um, so think about those five, and then you know, think about your own audit, and ask yourself how many of these things are you doing? Are you doing you know, three? Are you doing two? Are you doing all five? And if you are doing any, sorry, does someone want to ask a question? Yeah, I'm sorry. The, we do have a, a question, and I think it speaks to what you're talking about here, and that is um, when we're looking at these fact sheets, um, educate means to provide in-depth comprehensive information. Uh, so uh, the question is, could there be levels of fact sheets that are somewhat more educational or technical without you know going into a full white paper kind of thing. But you know, can there be different levels that you would produce of, of fact sheets? Depending on the uh, audience I would imagine. But. Well and I would say that it really depends I, well, I always like to be, and, and you know this, Tom. I like to be. Uh, I don't like to sit on the fence with these kind of, with anything when we're talking about these this kind of material. So I would say we want to be careful about the length of a fact sheet. Um, but and what I mean is, you know, seven pages at the beginning. I think there's stages, is what I'm trying to say. As I think, you know, that that whole point I said earlier about tell me more. If someone says tell me more. They want to. They they like. It's resonating with them on the value proposition. They like what you've put in front of them. They want. They now want the detail. The idea resonates. The value of it to them resonates. Tell me more. Then I say you get into much more technical detail. It's at the very beginning stages where you really want to be careful with that. Um, and so you know, again, recognizing the differences between labs. I think it's my point of view is you want to be separating those out and giving, you know, it's kind of like a two-pager to a ten-pager um, that gives much more information. So and really starts to uh, get into the how it works kind of level of detail. So that would be my approach as opposed to uh, just having the one seven-pager at the front end. Because I think what's the, the problem we run into, folks, is that, you know, people just can't absorb and won't absorb in this day and age that amount of information um, and unless there is just something so compelling, uh, such a burning problem that they just dive right in. But most people, it's you know the, the short attention span issue that we deal with. And so we have so much stuff coming through our email and our social media and coming at us through, you know, the cloud and so much that, um, and, and I would say even years ago, we could have done a better job pre all of those different types of noises out there. We, we still needed to have really compelling fact sheets that really speak about the value of the idea. So, so I would say that be careful of that. Um, I always love Mark Twain's quote, you know, if, I, if I'd had more time, I would have written you a short letter. Uh, so it, it's harder to write shorter documents. There's no question. And so I think that's where we're doing the work for our readers or our clients, let's call them, people we want to engage. Um, so you know, it, it behooves us to, to dig in and figure out how to do that. So, so I would say that you know, if you look at these questions and you think that you know, you're doing two or you're doing three of them, you know, what would you say if I told you that these five things are exactly what not to do to build a compelling fact sheet? Now that, you know, you'd say, wow, how's that? Now, and now if you're doing some of these things, don't despair. I mean, I think uh, it's, it's probably in the interpretation. But I would say we are guilty 
of doing some of these things, all of us, every now and again. But I hope to show you before we end today how to kind of flip this around and and not do this. I mean, particularly if you look at the first three points on here, that is the, the nature of what we see and what I have seen in the last, you know, if I just think about my last six months, I see a lot of documents that are so dense, so heavy on the, the, the nature of how the idea works. And I think that that's, you know, the, the common mistake, if you will, that a lot of us make is that ratio of, you know, um, just the, the density of information um, and charts of data and things like that about the idea before we've really engaged that person who's reading it in terms of what the value is to them. And so, as I said, there's some com we all have, you know, uh, bad habits and, and um, things we do with fact sheets, and there's some standard common mistakes. But I think, you know, some of the things that we are guilty of is that we look at having far too many points, um, and our points compete for attention in our fact sheets. We've got a lot of disjointed points. Um, appearing throughout the document. So, you know, it's, it's kind of coming back to different points. There's um, a lot of education, as I mentioned, uh, trying to inform people. Um, we talk a lot about, you know, the flow. Um, you know, in a fact sheet, you know, you're going to, you know, this whole point of a story is it should kind of, the reader should be able to feel the flow of information feel the story unfolding. And when there's no flow, it's very hard for the reader. You know, if you uh, read uh, stories or, or if you ever read stories to your children, right, it's the predictability of the story that creates a memorable um, message in the mind of the reader. It's that kind of predictability that we want to create in a fact sheet where someone goes, I can kind of sense what's happening here and how it's flowing because one of the key things I always say about a fact sheet is I want that reader to remember it. I want them to be able to tell it to someone else. So if someone said, you know, um, oh, that technology that you were talking about, that new t um, battery technology, you know, that fact sheet, what was that, you know, can you tell me about that? That someone can give the story to someone else, a third party in their organization at least in enough detail that, you know, we get the key facts represented. So flow is paramount. You know, flow is everything. It creates a rhythm and a logic to the document. Um, you know, people can anticipate where the document's going, and that's why I say um, asterisk that and look at the flow in your documents. Um, I'm just going to jump over the focus thing because I, I, you know, I think I've been beating on that um, quite a bit about focusing on the idea. The, the whole idea about um, wordy and, and fat words, right? Um, fat words are those 15-letter words or those four-letter acronyms that only a select few understand. And so you, know, you want to circle those in your fact sheets and look and say, how many times am I doing that? Um, and what I want to show you today about data is I'm not saying data is a bad thing, guys. But what I think we can do with data is make it visual. In other words, make it m visual and therefore memorable in the mind of the person that reads the fact sheet. So those um, metrics or measures that you have that make a technology really different and stand out, um, it's finding ways to, as I say, make them visual so that you end up with you know, not saying, you know, 4,276,000, you know, milliseconds. You get a visual picture in the mind of your reader about the metric of that data. And so uh, how you package your data it, to support your story is, is also important. And as I say, I think uh, we also watch for throwaway phrases, right? Um, the only, the, the world leading. Um, um, applicable in many applications. These are phrases that I call them throwaway because they really don't have teeth. In, they, they don't consist of teeth. And so, you know, if we're going to put a phrase in there, we need to put phrases in there that really have substance um, to speak of, and not just, you know, the world leading or there's no there's no com competitive alternative to this technology. These kinds of things we want to watch for um, in our fact sheets. And so. 
You know, the missing piece in many fact sheets is, as I said, the storyline. And that, you know, again, is the, you know, the key, key point against all these other things I'm talking about. Those, the other things support this point that if you can weave a compelling story throughout your fact sheets, and if you think of your fact sheet as a story to that reader, to that uh, audience out there, industry partner, et cetera, corporate guy, gal, if you think about what story am I telling, um, I think stories are the purest form of communication, and a story you know, really evokes emotion. And I think that that's where you start to forge a connection with your clients that you're trying to um, either license technology or get a CRADA or whatever it might be. Um, I think it's really important that you know facts and data are important in your fact sheet, but the story really matters because stories resonate more than facts. And stories, as I say, they get into the, the pit of your stomach, and you can recall them and remember them. So, you know, as I say, this is what I want to kind of zero in on uh, in the short time that we have today is really how do you actually create that nice storyline. Um, and if you're doing that, you're building a storyline, what you'll see is you'll see these kinds of ingredients in the fact sheet. They're, they're not complicated. They're not heavy in terms of data. They have a lot of visual words. They have a lot of mental pictures and metaphors. Um, they're very crisp. Right? They're, they, you'll find that they become two- and three-page. If you've got seven-page fact sheets now or five-page even, you'll find that as you start to really look at your, your technologies in terms of some of the ingredients of making a great story, um, then you'll start to see that, in fact, they can become, they do become shorter. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that is where the person calls you and says, what you sent me is quite interesting and I'd like to know more. That, to me, is the success of a great fact sheet. People are connecting with it and it has a nice storyline. So you're probably going, okay, but then what am I putting in this fact sheet to create this kind of story? So the three things that you see on the, the screen here, in my mind, um, are really the essence of a great fact sheet. Right? These three words, to me, are uh, what creates that rhythm, what creates the foundation of the story, and then the other elements um, you wrap around it to actually make a nice, uh, well-articulated uh, fact sheet. So, so in my mind, a story has five key ingredients, but you know, built loosely around the themes that you see here on the screen. And in the time that remains, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through these five ingredients and give you something, you know, a little bit more concrete than what we've been talking about maybe so far as to how can I create these kinds of um, characteristics inside my, my own fact sheets. So first of all, um, the first thing we'll talk Before about is Before we get about, started, can we ask another question? Sure. Yeah, okay. So the question is, are there any iconic books on using the power of story or narrative for corporate communication? Yes, there are. There are. And it's story. Um, I've seen some um, um, themes on Amazon. Amazon's got a great selection of books out for storytelling for corporate communications. Um, if the group likes, what I can do is, you know, just maybe – suggest two or three, um, but the whole notion of storytelling is, ver is becoming very popular um, in the corporate circles in terms of how to engage um, your target groups, right, and, and build these kind of compelling messages. So yes, um, and I'm happy to kind of share, um, and I can provide that to you and Lauren, that's no problem. Great, thank you. Yeah, um, and I think that, you know, what what I propose to do here is really distill it down. Um, so it's, it's almost like uh, in the next 20 minutes we're going to distill down maybe a couple of books and give you some, uh, as many of you know, give you some tools to actually use um, to actually help to craft these stories. So as I, uh, as I mentioned um, 
earlier when I talked a little bit about the value proposition. It has to be, you know, that has to be a core part of the storyline. And that value proposition has to be focused on the commercial opportunity. So in other words, it has to be focused on the commercial or slash business opportunity for the reader, not the technology value proposition. So that's a different thing. If you're talking about the technology value proposition, you're really talking more about the attributes and characteristics of the technology itself. What I suggest you do is you really focus on what is the value proposition for that um, person who is reading your document. And that's why I say you may end up maybe with two or three different fact sheets because you'll have different audiences. But it's you know, it's the old adage, folks, is that you, you, know, you really get you know, bees to honey if you really focus on what, they're, you know, what flavor they like best, right? And use the language that they like and that they know and speak to them and engage them in a way that they uh, feel comfortable. Well, sometimes to do that, you, you, know, you can't just broad brush it. You can't use big, broad um, documents. You've got to tailor your documents. So, and you've got to tailor your value proposition because I would bet that if we go back to the earlier example where I said military, um, defense, and say, I don't know, healthcare, each of those sectors are going to look at your technologies in a very different way. And even if they might have a similar application, they behave differently. These are different types of organizations inside these sectors with different motivations and behaviors and criteria. So using one fact sheet for all three, I think, um, or even to talk about applications in all three is, um, you know, it's a bit broad brushing. It wouldn't be something that I would recommend if it was me. So um, a technique I use is to think about, if I'm developing a value proposition, is to, you know, think about the three questions that you see in the light bulbs. Um, to make, and I use this, you know, and it's loosely the so what, who cares by you in my mind, but that's just the way I think, is to think about these three questions to make sure I've got the value proposition nailed down. You know, what is the essence of the concept, and can I explain that? Um, why is it valuable, and how is it different? And I think, in essence, that's what we want to do here, is we want to tell someone in a fact sheet, what is the essence of the idea? Why does it matter to them? And what's compelling about it? And you know, think of these three questions as the roots to your tree. You know, and if any one of these the answers is weak, it's going to be a wobbly story. So it's going to blow in the wind. <laughs> so think about these three. And you know, as I say, I don't want to leave you blowing in the wind. So let's uh, let's look at these questions, and I'll give you some maybe some techniques to try to build out some really uh, some quality answers. Um, First, what is the concept? My suggestion uh, to everyone is don't get the problem, you know, what's the problem and the solution mixed in together. Keep them clean and, and, and clear. Talk about problem and then talk about solution. Um, that might be semantics to you a little bit, but to me it's not. I mean, keep it nice and clean. Show the reader that you really understand the, the problem that they face. And so, you know, really, you know, if you're not mixing them together, I think it's important to really look at the problem and talk about what is the commercial problem that this technology is proposing to solve. And, you know, I always like to think about problems in terms of, is it a valuable problem in this to, to this type of reader. And what I mean by this is, is there an urgency to solve this problem? In other words, you know, we look at um, battery technologies today and battery density and things in that area. And, you know, are you addressing a problem that is, you know, this kind of, uh, of issue, this kind of urgency to solve? Is, this, is it a valuable problem that you know this particular audience has been wrestling with? Or is this something new and novel, a future problem that they don't yet know exists? And if that's the case, then you'll want to paint a picture of the future state, right? Talk about how this problem is going to unfold in future 
and then talk about you know the context of the solution for the future. But paint a picture, right? Um, draw the connection for that person as to here is the state of the um, the industry or the market today. And in 18 months, two years, I mean, we see a lot of technologies here at WKI, a lot of organizations that are in this future state. We see them out five years sometimes. And it's being able to show people the point of view about what that environment is going to look like in future. Paint them that picture so that they can draw the connection. This is a perfect place, by the way, to engage the inventor and have them talk about their point of view about why is the future going to unfold in this way. And, you know, draw me that picture, that timeline of what's going to happen. Because I think that when you're describing the problem in a fact sheet, if it's a future problem, it's this context that engages the reader. You know, why now should they be interested in this idea? Because you're talking about a future solution. So, you know, pique their interest by um, being able to present a picture of that. Um, I'm a big believer on the solution side of really keeping the ideas clean and simple. Um, and, and by this, when you start to talk about solution, I mean don't overly complicate things. I mean, we use a technique uh, here at WKI called just very simply that it's a napkin drawing to help, you know, to get inventors to zoom out on the technology and just place it in a context that's more easily understood. Um, I'll show you on the next slide just an example of what I mean by this, but it works quite well. Um, you can also use um, analogies and metaphors to help draw connection to the reader. Um, it's you know a favorite of mine lately is you know the analogy. It's like it's like an airbag for bicycle helmets or a smart card for blood diagnostics. Um, a zip line for wound closure. This is what I mean by analogies and metaphors, especially when technologies are very nebulous. It's a great way to, again, visually draw that connection with the reader. So don't be shy to, uh, first of all, really clearly focus on that business problem and place that in context right up front. That's a section for my, you know, for my um, experience. Having the problem as the first section to me is the magic. I want the problem, and then I want the idea, the solution, in other words, to come down below. Because that's when we're talking about value propositions. You're placing the idea in the context of the business problem. So I'm watching my time here, so I'm, I'm conscious of that. The other thing I would say, folks, is if you've got game-changing technologies, if you're working on some really you know, you see some inventors with some really cool, new, you know, future disruptive things. Um, I definitely, at this stage, about what is the concept, would talk about the value chain in my fact sheet and talk about how this new idea impacts the value chain because it may displace or disrupt something that's going on in that value chain with the current participants, and that's a very powerful statement to make at the front end of a fact sheet that this is a, you know, a very key technology for the next stage of evolution in this value chain. I think um, I would devote time to discussing that in my fact sheet. So that is what is the concept. And as I mentioned, here is, uh, just to give you an example of, and, and if you have time, you can go back and maybe um, look at this slide again um, in the downloadable presentations. But this is a great just example of how some complex technology is described in very plain terms. Um, it's talking about you know, the whole notion of um, flow batteries, and they've got a, te a technology that they say that isn't like a traditional lithium-ion battery. So they really create context by talking about the, the alternative, and then they talk about how the technology works. It can be cheaper than traditional lithium batteries, but it's more flexible. You can add more tanks. It can last much longer. But I really encourage you to take um, a, a look at this because it's really plain, simple language here for a new technology. And you know, just to just to be totally transparent, I did not know anything about redox 
you know, battery flow technology, but I can understand what they're talking about when I read this description. And they've got some great phrases that they use. What's particularly unique about a vanadium flow battery is that it doesn't degrade over time. You know, you don't have to divorce yourself from every single technical word, but you just have to wrap it with language that people go, oh, okay, I get that. Um, the battery lasts forever. Um, as lithium batteries uh, charge and discharge, right, they lose their capacity. So they recognize um, the alternatives and really use those alternatives to place their own idea in terms of its key advantages. So, uh, and as I say, um, I, of course, love pictures. So I, too, would not be shy about simple napkin drawings in my, in my fact sheets. I think, uh, again, just creating that kind of high-level zoom-out picture to give people that sense. I mean, uh, it's human nature for us to look at pictures, uh, and some, some simple pictures with some words can, can really make that connection, as I say, with, with the reader. Uh, why is it valuable? So really looking at you know, um, these, this whole issue, something I think we all do from time to time is we gloss over the quote unquote applications. I, I call this the, the trap of broad applications. I see this phrase a lot when I see uh, the fact sheets that I do get the opportunity to see. I, I see they write, it can be used for a broad number of applications. And I always say, wow, such a missed opportunity because you know, it can be used for many different things. Well, you know, to say that, I would rather really talk about the context for how it can be used. Um, so I would drill down to draw more of a connection. So uh, the tool that you see, the visual tool that you see on the, the right here is a tool that we use a lot called the Segment Straw Man. And you can download this at the link I'll give you at the, uh, the end of today. But it's a great way, again, um, either for yourself or together with the inventor to just broker the discussion about you know, what are the applications and can we look a little closer at how might they use it. I think um, I use a lot of phrases with inventors about let's just explore. Let's just, you know, we're not looking for you to have the right answer. Just Let's just talk this through and, you know, what do we think might be the context for which this would be used in a um, operating room uh, or you know whatever the the scenario might be so I think what what we can help to uh, wrap around the technology and looking at the the customer applications or the user applications is really first drawing that out of the inventor and then saying all right so what who might make these kinds of decisions, and what are the motivations? Um, what's their world like, in other words? And I'm not suggesting that we have to be expert at this, but the more that we can just try to paint a little bit more context around the application, how might it be used, right? Um, so that we can describe a picture a little bit more about, you know, it would be used in rail applications for e-ticketing in these kinds of situations or, you know, whatever it might be. I think um, pushing, you know, ourselves to really try to put that detail and, and get up close and personal, I think this is where the storyline comes to life. And this is where it gets memorable for the reader. So this is where they start to go, okay, I can see that. And even if, even if that context isn't the one that they would use it for, it draws a connection for them because they go, okay, I see how this would play out. I can see that kind of um, application and how it would be used. I'm going to maybe use it differently, but I can see the connection. So um, as I say, you can pique the interest of your reader if you find ways to create these kind of use cases um, that show the, the technology or the science in their world. And it's, it's definitely, definitely, definitely worth the time investment to, to do this because it really builds that foundation in your, in your fact sheet. Um, and as I say, the, this is up on the, the site and uh, with a little bit of a tip, tip sheet with it to show you how to use it. Um, and finally, we come to, well, maybe not finally, but finally, certainly in terms of the triple of, you know, what is this concept, why is it valuable, and how is it different, uh, we come to the, the whole area about um, how is it different. And I think 
this is what the readers, you know, if I can be as crass as to say this, I think this is what readers are buying, right? When someone looks to a lab to uh, acquire a technology, this is what they're buying. They're buying the differentiator, so the significant point of difference, I say. Um, not everybody wants to hear me say that, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, Me Too stuff that can get wrapped around technologies. But this is, um, this is what you want them to see, and this is what you want them to remember. So um, a little bit of a heads up here is to make sure that you don't pay equal attention to all the different features in a technology. What is the differentiator? And you should turn up the volume on that differentiator and don't let it get lost inside a paragraph. Um, if the reader has to go hunting for that, that's a bad thing, right? So, you know, the, the, we always talk about benefits and differentiators. I think there's a lot of features that you have to have to make something operate. There are the checklist items that you have to have, but then there's the way you do something differently. And that's where you want to make that shine in your fact sheet and really talk about you know, the, the value that it brings to those use case scenarios. Um, like I said, this is what the licensee or the partner is paying for, so highlight it. So, so to summarize, there's three pieces then to your storyline. What's the concept? Why is it valuable? And why is it different? And you know, consider addressing these questions inside your fact sheets and, and think about, as I was saying, the flow to actually get it to weave the story through those three questions. Because it will. You'll be able to weave the story along through those um, as you go. Um, Tom, on my screen it's showing, uh, it says my presentation is scheduled to end in five minutes. Yes, we've got it extended, and I do want to just tell the folks who are listening that the next session is actually a pre-recorded session, so they can join that at any time if, if I'd like to stay on here as you finish up. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure because, okay, I've got, a, I've got my screen back onto the right place anyway. So, um, okay, well, we're almost done, so it'll only be a couple more minutes, folks. Um, and so not to, I don't want to jump off this point too soon, though. So, again, if uh, if there was... You know, again, one of one or two things that you're only if you're going to focus on taking away one or two things, I would say, you know, I don't like to just have to pick one or two things, but this is something that I think we um, we can look at our current fact sheets and we can do a really great job to tweak them by really looking at are we isolating the significant point of difference in the fact sheet and making it stand out? Because I can tell you that those people on the industry side of the table, that's going to be, you know, they're, when they're scanning a fact sheet, that's kind of what they're looking for. Even the most brilliant of minds, if they understand your domain, they're looking and going, okay, what's going on with this technology? What's different about it? So, the, you know, whatever you can do to call that out, and it's not just window dressing, it's really being able to articulate um, and again, that's um, um, those of you that have the relationships with the inventors to again broker these conversations. That's a great uh, a great thing to do is separate the my uh, coming from a farming background as a child. My father used to say separate the wheat from the chaff. So that's what we need to do here is uh, get those things separated out. Um, and then that brings us to these visual words and data points. If you can get that structure of the value proposition and that story flowing, I'm kind of waving my arms here, I know you can't see me, but if you can get the story flowing, then you start to say, all right, my final piece of this puzzle is to really make sure that the language that I'm using paints a picture in the mind of that reader. Have I got the language in a way that resonates? Uh, remember I said earlier that we spent a lot of time focusing uh, on the technology. Well, here's where we spend a lot of time now looking at the way that we have packaged the value proposition. Um, and it's useful to look, as I say, again, take a look at your own fact sheets and look. How many visual words and phrases do you have in your current fact sheets? And by visual words, you know, here's some examples for you. The size of a smartphone, the window into the body, you know, the bony part of the eardrum. This is what I mean by visual words. If you're, you know, particularly trying to explain a new idea to someone, 
Um, can you use these kinds of things where there's a mental picture now placed in their minds? And can you look at your data points um, you know, we use often a lot of big numbers in our, our information we share. Um, but how, sorry, I have an extra zero there on my 385,000, but, um, you know, three out of ten, uh, five out of every seven, you know, using things that actually people can, can hang on to, they grasp. Um, and, and those kinds of things, believe it or not, um, I don't have any uh, statistical data to support this, but people hang on to that e more easily. They recall it more easily than a big number. So strive for that as well because I think that, you know, again, just you know, do like your uh, public school teacher used to do to me and take a red marker and go down your fact sheets and circle all of the places where you say, I could use better words here. I could use a visual word. I could change that data point. Um, and I think that's what we're after today is really just tweaking um, in many cases to improve your, your fact sheet. So um, as promised, on the, on the packaging side of your fact sheets, I think um, there is a bit of a different, and you saw that a little bit, this adjust for concept versus product ideas, in that if you're talking about a future idea, You'll be introducing things like the value chain. You'll be talking about the future context of the problem and why the future is going to unfold like that. So concept stage ideas, those ones that are maybe a little further out, you have to adjust your fact sheets a little bit. Product ideas, product enhancements, things that people can grasp. Um, for example, you don't need analogies and metaphors as much if you've got a product-based idea that's well-known, right? It's an alternative to something. People understand the category. They understand the context. Um, but you will want to make sure you adjust your style of your fact sheet um, if you've got either a, a concept or a product idea. Um, I'm a, you know, as you can tell, I'm a rambler, uh, so I have to watch this. I have to, you know, take the red marker to my own material and get to the point. Um, I find I often take too long to get into the meat. So, um, you know, watch that for yourselves. And, and watch that you have, as I say, more story and less information. And, and what I mean by that is that you are really putting that, that storyline and context together in the paragraphs that roll down your fact sheet. You're not just um, presenting data and presenting information. Everything should connect, right? Everything should flow and have a role to play in the fact sheet. Um, and believe it or not, this isn't as daunting as we think. It's just a, it's starting out with the right objective in mind and uh, being very story-centered when you, when you start out. Um, I, this was shared with me as a technique uh, about five years ago, and it stuck with me. Is, uh, someone said to me, are you excited when you write? And I kind of looked at them and said, well, I don't know. <laughs> so, and I think that's very true. Is Are you passionate? Are you excited? It does, especially when we're writing and we're presenting, it does come through. So, you know, again, it's, it's us getting into the right frame of mind as well in terms of when we're packaging up these, uh, these stories that, uh, you know, shines through in our fact sheets. Um, Something I didn't, I chose to just leave out today, but that you can find online on the link that I'm going to give you is um, we had a technique that I introduced to the FLC participants in the last webinar um, talking about the three words, and it seemed to resonate with a lot of folks, was if you had to pick uh, three words that could describe your value proposition, you know, you want three things you want people to remember, and they can only be three words, what would those three words be? And I remember coming to the FLC meeting last April, and people were saying to me, I'm still trying to figure out my three words. So it's another uh, tool, another technique um, that you can use with your fact sheets is to pause for a moment once you've got your story together and say, okay, so what are those three words that I want to repeat throughout my fact sheet that actually reflect my story, right? that really speak to the heart of the value of this technology. What are the three words? And then you know, start to weave those into your fact sheet. Um, and I would say on packaging also, final point is that you know, have a net takeaway. What do you want the call to action to be? 
what is the point of all of this? Um, again, don't leave the reader to make that decision. What is it you want them to do? Um, so put it in there right, right at the end. What is the next step? Do you want them to call you? Uh, do you want them to download something? Do you? What is it? Right? Um, you know, it's of course we want them to, you know, whatever the end result is, to sign a license with us or whatever it is. But but what is the next step that leads us to that outcome? Uh, think about that and and be strategic in your fact sheets by you know pushing that behavior so that they do it. Right? Um, okay. So. Um, in summary, I would say that fact sheets, um, as I said, they should be pitch documents. They're not technical briefs, and, and that may be a little bit of a mind shift uh, for some of you. But you know, try to think about them a little bit more like that, right? Try to think these are documents that are the vehicle for the technology transfer office to communicate out the value of their technologies. So those are not technical briefs. Those are pitch documents. Um, so approach them with that kind of uh, that kind of spice in terms of the story. Watch for those fat words, right? Watch for the the technology that people don't understand. That you you know you need to be a, more of a subject matter expert. Um, really work on your storylines. Look at that story in terms of what is the concept, why is it valuable, how is it different. Engage people in that story. Make it real for them. Use those visual words to really push that story into the two-pager. Uh, I always say aim for you know the the two-thirds, one-third, uh, two-thirds story, <laughs> one-third technology, and see if we can shift the ratio a little bit more in that direction. Uh, maybe we don't get there right away, but maybe we get there a little bit of a t uh, a little bit at a time. And you know, as I say, I think the real test of the fact sheet is when the reader can tell the story to someone else. So the reader can articulate the value of the technology to someone else, perhaps in their office or a, you know a colleague, etc. Uh, you know, it's uh, that phrase: you only get uh, one chance to make a first impression. So we we want to make it count, right? We want to do a lot of work for those people that we're trying to engage, so they don't have to do all that work themselves, um, because most of the time they won't, right? Most of the time they just glance through it, and maybe they don't get the essence of the idea the way we had intended them to, and that's a that's a an unfortunate thing. So. So my hope is, you know, I love this quote, you know, these ideas, it's simple for me to say, but doing them is tricky. Um, and so, you know, try one or two of these techniques. Um, as I said, try some of the tools that you can download off our site. Um, don't throw away anything you're doing now. I think it's a matter of iterating things and, and tweaking them and testing out some new ideas to, to see if they're going to work for us in, in our current, uh, current situation. So, um, I think that's it. Thank you so, so much for inviting me. It's always such a pleasure to uh, participate in uh, the FLC events. Um, the link on the screen now is where you'll access the templates. Um, and Lauren will be putting uh, or giving you information about how to access the recording for this webinar if you'd like to do that. But this, um, this page on our website is reserved for the FLC. If you go to the bottom of the page on this link, you'll find templates of ours that you're free to download and use. We don't take this page down. Um, and as well, you'll find the tools that I referenced in the presentation up on that site as well, and you can download those. So, Okay, so Tom, I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Wendy, thank you very much. That was a very comprehensive and very clear presentation uh, for us all to uh, follow. Um, I don't have any further questions at this point, um, okay. except I do have just kind of one sort of query, and that you kind of touched on it off and on through the talk. And do you recommend then, uh, or or do you think there should be one sheet that fact sheet or multiple fact sheets for a given technology, depending on the audience? I think there should be multiple, Tom. Okay, good. Because the use cases will be different. Yes, absolutely. Um, and just to, so everybody's clear, even if it was a platform technology that could be used the same way in three different types of, of customer sites, let's call them, 
the reality is is those customers are different. And the mm-hmm. way that they their motivations and their their behaviors, their criteria, what makes them tick, uh, how they'll want to do business with the lab, um, they're, it's all different. Uh, so we want to keep the fact sheet speaking to each of them. And I think if we try to combine them, we lose that focus. That's fantastic. So, again, okay. thank you very much, Wendy. Excellent, oh. uh, excellent talk and uh, learned a lot. Hope others yes. in the audience have done so. Um, I invite uh, the folks in the audience to, um, to continue to um, – to move through the virtual site, check out the, some of the other uh, webinars that are up there. Um, many of them are, they, you can go into them and start them uh, from the very beginning. Also check out the exhibit area. Uh, and then tomorrow um, we'll have some more presentations um, and a lot more um, industry focus. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you again, Wendy. Much appreciated, and oh, we'll sign pleasure. off. My pleasure. Okay. Thank, thank you, everyone, for, for staying in the room uh, over time. Uh, I appreciate that, and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.